All right, guys, Acts chapter 4. We're in session 13. Uh, we're going to be covering verses 23 through 31. And so we're going to be talking about what the boldness of the Holy Spirit, the empowering boldness of the Holy Spirit, actually looks like in the life of the believer, as well as what the counterfeit versions of that look like. So it should be a pretty, uh, pretty provocative, a pretty, thank you, a pretty provocative message. I'm sure we'll get some, uh, some thumbs down on YouTube. Uh, so if I were to ask each one of you guys, what in your own mind it looks like when you imagine, when you picture the empowering of the Holy Spirit, we would probably get, you know, a whole bunch of different answers, but most of us, we'd probably think of some like mega evangelist, like Mark Cahill, right? Or we would think of like Ray Comfort, right? Something like that. Or perhaps a missionary or a pastor or worship leader or what have you. And I'm not saying that those are necessarily wrong. I think there's definitely something to that. But like we always point out, what we think, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is what? what it says here. Absolutely. What does the Bible say, right? That's what we should always go back to. What does the Bible say that the empowering boldness of the Holy Spirit looks like in the life of the believer? So some people would say it would make us outspoken. You see a lot of people who are very outspoken about a variety of topics, you know, and they would say that's the boldness of the Holy Spirit. But then, I don't know, because you look at the scriptures, right? Jesus, the most filled with the Holy Spirit per person who ever lived, right? He was meek, right? Was he outspoken? No, he was meek. He was very obviously filled with the Holy Spirit more than any person who ever lived, and yet he was meek, he was gentle. And so that doesn't seem to fit. Well, how about does it make us spontaneous on our evangelistic efforts? You know, and perhaps it can to a degree. We seem to see something like that in the Bible. But when looking at the accounts that we have actually recorded in the Bible, that's not the main result that we see from the empowering boldness of the Holy Spirit. Some in our church culture today would say it's best shown, and this is really huge, guys, especially where we live, that the empowering boldness of the Holy Spirit is best shown in us taking a firm stand against the darkness, the evil that is so prevalent in our culture, in our society today. They would say that our job as Christians is to be culture warriors, standing against the, ri or the rising tide of evil in our nation and in our world. And that's been the position for, what, you know, 30, 40 years since we had that contract with America. You probably remember this, Joe. Right? They're like, we're going to be the moral majority. How's America gotten in the last 30 years, guys? That's worked swimmingly well, huh? We've totally, we killed it, bro. We are yeah, we fixed it, huh? But that's what a lot of people who are Christians would say, that the empowering boldness of the Holy Spirit, it makes us culture warriors, and we need, to, we need to fight. We need to take it back. How's that worked since we started having that mindset about 30, 40 years ago? It went from like this, like trending down to like, <laughs> yeah, that's not working. Not so great. You know, the world's in free fall, and don't give me that whole, it's cyclical nonsense. It's been in free fall for, for 60 years. Well, the murder rate's down. Yeah, okay, I guess abortion's not murder then, or what? Definitely not. And, you know, not to mention they just charged the, they just changed the reporting of crime statistics. You know, this is something we've discussed before on Friday nights and stuff, but they're saying that the crime rate's getting better and everything. Yeah, you know why? Because in preparation for the uh, selection, I mean the election, they changed reporting requirements to voluntary. So now all the biggest states, all the biggest uh, cities in America are not required to report their crime statistics. It's voluntary. So guess what happened? All the numbers went down. No more crime anymore. We just closed. Oh, there's nothing. Everything's great. It's dark outside. What happened? You know, this is, it's insane. And we always make the point, you know, imagine something so important that the Bible totally forgot to mention it. Guys, if our job as Christians, was to be culture warriors, don't you think the Bible would have mentioned that? 
if our Bible was to be fought in the in the the world rather than in the spiritual realm, don't you think that the Bible would have mentioned that? That sounds pretty important, right? That sounds like something God would have mentioned. Rome during the time of Christ made San Francisco look like Mayberry. Rome was absolutely insane around the time of Christ. There was everything you can imagine. Like, imagine our culture in, like, going forward, like, 50 years, but without the technology. It was like that. There was, like, things with kids, and, like, it was really crazy. It was really crazy. And yet, you know, they weren't, they weren't focused on that. I mean, you can't make a case from the Bible that they were focused on that. They were so busy fighting the darkness and the culture that they forgot to preach the gospel. No, they were so busy preaching the gospel that they forgot to fight the darkness. Within a few hundred years, they did this, preaching the gospel in the, in the most dark climate you could imagine. And the result of that was within a few hundred years, the whole world, the whole known world basically had been won for Christ. And we entered like a golden age of humanity. The Catholic Church came along and kind of clamped that down. But then the word of God spread forth after the Enlightenment when the printing press was created and invented. And then, you know, the word of God began to spread again. That golden age flourished again. And it's like, you see how dark Rome was. And that did not get fixed. It did not get changed by people trying to fight that. It got changed by people getting saved. We saved our way out of it. We didn't, you know rush limbaugh our way out of it we led people to jesus and that's what happened and it makes sense guys if you walk into a dark room you immediately start swatting away the darkness right all you guys are like so dark in here is that what you do what do you do if you walk into a dark room yeah you flip the chris tries to feel his way along in the darkness and his life reflects no 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 you flip on the light switch right that's what you do, right? You'd flip on the light switch, for sure. You'd, fi- you'd flip on the light switch. The only thing that will fix this world is the love of Jesus Christ, guys, not the hatred of the lost. You know, there's that old saying that the, I think it was the Puritans, there go I if not for the grace of God. That's all of us. When we, when we look at the world, we're basically looking in a mirror of who we were before Jesus Christ. Should we get angry by upset by that angered by that or should we have a a heart that's broken for that jesus when he was looking out over the fields at the people you know the people i looked at the masses and it says he his heart was broken he was he lived you know he was he was weeping he's like the the people are just broken they're lost they're like sheep without a shepherd what's our heart is our heart to attack that and to stand on a gay pride flag while smoking a cigar or is our flag while or is our our battle preaching the gospel to these people, loving these people, realizing that they need Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to change them. So we got to be very careful in terms of what we do. We shouldn't be hating the lost. You know, and it shouldn't surprise us knowing these things, that in the scriptures, the empowering boldness of the Holy Spirit doesn't lead to social activism or anti-whatever ministries but rather, as we'll see, something far more powerful, something that won't just save our depraved culture, but will even save men's souls. That's the thing that the, the effect of the thing that the scripture recommends. And so with that introduction, let's go ahead and dive into this morning's text, verses 23 through, 20, uh, 23 through 31 of Acts chapter 4. So starting in verse 23, we read, And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Verse 27, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. 
Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Awesome. So basically, you know, they got released from jail after getting in trouble for healing this dude and then preaching the gospel and all this. And they get released. They get threatened. You know, don't preach in the name of Jesus. Remember last week? And they're like, eh, whether you say to do this and God tells us who we're going to obey, you or God. Like, you know, of course, we're going to keep doing it, basically, is what they said. And so what's the first thing that we see take, pray, take place after this? Well, take a look. Look at verses 24 through 26. It says, so when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them by who the mouth, uh, excuse me, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So here, the first thing we see immediately is the disciples pray. So this is good. You know, they're learning their lesson. They immediately pray. And not only do they pray, they pray with an emphasis on God's word and with the expectation of fulfilled prophecy, right? They're looking, they're like, this is exactly what God said will happen. Awesome. They quote Psalm 2. And instead of, instead of getting upset at the persecution by the religious leaders, they recognize, hey, you know, this is exactly what God told us is going to happen. The religious authorities, you know, those in power, they're all going to align themselves against God, against Jesus. And of course, tragically, that's definitely what's continuing to happen, right? The religious leaders, they just keep doubling down. It is tragic. And we see that as we make our way through the book of Acts again and again. You're just like, man, how are they so blind? But like we read in Romans, you know, blindness has come in part to Israel till the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And so we shouldn't you know, freak out. We shouldn't be surprised when we receive pushback for talking to people about Jesus. It is part of the deal. God told us it would be this way. We're in a battle and Satan's not just going to take it lying down. He's going to push back and we should be expecting that. And the reality is church, it's not us that they really have a problem with. If we're being good Christians and preaching the gospel, it's God. You know, the Bible in John three nineteen says they don't want to come to Jesus because their deeds are evil. They want to keep doing their thing. Their problem is not with you. Their problem is with God. Generally speaking, people, as you guys, most of you guys know, people don't like to be told that they're wrong, that they need to change. But that's not our message, guys. That's Jesus's message. That's the Bible's message. And it makes sense, right? If it was based upon intelligence, would it be fair that people got saved? If the smartest people got saved, that wouldn't be very fair, would it? God's determined if we're smart or not to a large degree. Obviously, you can exercise that a little bit and try to improve that. But generally speaking, if you know, there's some people that are just smarter than others. So it wouldn't be very fair for God only to save the smart people and you get to hell and it's like all the dumb people are there and you're like, I don't know. It just kind of feels messed up. It's kind of like punching down. I don't know. No, that would not be fair. So what's God do? He makes it about repentance. Are you going to be stiff-necked? Are you going to be hard-hearted? Or will you admit when you're wrong? I always talk to the young adults about this on Fridays. If you have the choice between someone who's really smart and someone who's really nice, pick the really nice person. Because at the end of the day, really smart, okay, that'll take you a little ways. But someone who's really nice, that's a lot better. You'd rather have someone who has a soft heart, a teachable spirit, who admits when they're wrong, who's not hard-headed and a jerk and these kinds of things. So God's not much different in that sense. He's not looking for the people who are super smart. He made them that way. That does not impress them. It does not impress him. He's looking for the people that have a teachable spirit, the people that will humble themselves and realize like, all right, I screwed up. 
I need God. I need Jesus. And that's what repentance is, right? It's having that change of heart from being like, I got it, figured it out, I'm awesome, to being like, no, I, I'm terrible, I'm a dirtbag, I need Jesus. And so that's what God is looking for, the people that would have a soft heart, the people that would repent. And that's God's message. And it's not our message. And it, it might offend people, guys, but at the end of the day, it's not like it's us and we have like a personal fetish with people repenting, like repent. No, this is the, the only way we can come to God. We have to come to God. We have to churn from our sin. We have to recognize like, all right, I fall short. And so, yes, it's going to offend people, guys, but they're not offended at you. They're offended at God. And that's, you know, unavoidable to a large degree. It's not us that they are rejecting, it's God. And we see that in verses 27 and following, where they talk about that. Take a look at verses 27 and following. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So first, let's talk about this. We see a lot of people who like to blame the Jews for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, right? Well, here it says, Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, that's us, and the people of Israel. So I think the, bl the blame is spread pretty evenly. I think uh, there's the old saying, you know, if you want to blame someone for, for the crucifixion, look in the mirror, right? Blame yourself. It's your sin. It's, it's us. It's our problem. And so we shouldn't just, like, lay the blame at one group of people and be like, it's their fault. No, the Bible is very clear. It's all of our sin. We all need a savior. You know, here we have in verse 28, a verse that those who espouse Calvinistic leaning take and they use it as a launch pad to go far beyond what is written, which is funny. The Bible tells us do not go beyond what is written, but they'll take this verse and they'll say that because God predetermines some things therefore he must predetermine all things including picking some people for heaven and other people for hell he picks he decides who will reject him and then he sends them to hell to be tortured forever because he made them unable to come to him unable to repent unable to be saved that sounds totally normal, right? That sound, that makes, yeah, that checks out. You're like, sounds right. Sounds like an awesome, loving God. That's a belief called Calvinism or Reformed theology, Reformed. And it is the dominant belief in this area. But in order to believe that, using verses like this as our rationale, we actually have to commit, we have to first twist the scriptures, but we have to commit several logical fallacies and I would encourage all of you guys who are interested in interacting with Calvinists to write these logical fallacies down and familiarize yourself with these as they can be very useful. So first, let's take a look at the verse that they use. Verse 28. Take a look at verse 28. It says, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So here we have the Bible very clearly telling us that God determined beforehand to have some of the people around the time of Christ reject Christ and crucify Christ. So God ordained a very specific thing to happen here. Therefore, God has ordained all things, right? Wait, no. That doesn't make sense. You can believe that. You can use you can believe that, but that's not what this verse is saying. And you have to be willing to commit logical fallacies in order to make this verse that says God determined something would happen to mean that God determined that all things ever would happen, including you rejecting him or whatever it is. So there's several logical fallacies this leads us to. The first one is the, the every all fallacy or the fallacy of every and all. So it's a form of equivocation, but basically it says because something is true of one thing, it must be true of all things. Like, no, that's a logical fallacy. Like, if we were in speech and debate, and we had the, you know, the provisionist group, you know, the Bible believers on one side and the Calvinists on the other side, and the Calvinists stood up and said, well, here it says this happened, so God determines all. The judge in a speech and debate would be like, all right, you get docked a point, you guys just lost a point, logical fallacy. Your team would just lose a point, 
right? We'd be like, nope, that's a logical fallacy. You guys just lost the point in the debate. So that's the first one we see. It's the, the fallacy of every and all, believing that because something is true of one thing, it must be true of all things. Because God determined this, therefore God determined everything. That's a logical fallacy. This is not up for debate. You, don't, you can love Calvinism and be like, I don't, I don't care, I still believe Calvinism. Okay, but you're committing logical fallacies as long as you're cool with that. The next one is called hasty generalization. It's basically forming a broad conclusion based upon a small or unrepresentative sample. Meaning, I walked around, I talked to three people, they said they love tacos, everyone loves tacos. Well, that's a hasty generalization. You've jumped a little too far there. Again, because God determined one thing does not mean God has determined all things. That's a logical fallacy. And the final one is the package deal fallacy, which is treating dissimilar concepts as though they are similar. What do I mean? Well, God determining that Jesus would go to the cross so that we could be saved is a whole lot different than saying he's determined everyone who goes to heaven in hell. Like, that's a whole different enchilada right there. You're like, oh, that's a very big difference. He's like, I determined this is going to happen. Like, oh, cool. He's like, yeah, uh, I determined everyone's going to hell and I didn't even give him a chance. Be like, that seems a little different. That seems like a whole, like, lot different. Yeah, that's a package deal. You're just folding it together. Well, he determined this, so he determined that too. No. These are logical fallacies that Calvinism must employ if it wants to use verses like this to mean that because God has determined, or the other one in the book of Acts where it's like, God determined the nations and boundaries. Like, oh, therefore God determined everything. Like, well, no, he determined that there's going to be countries. Else, How would he have the end times thing happen where there's these different countries that existed around the time of uh, Christ and Israel and they were the nations, the enemies, uh, the nations that were the enemies of Israel. Those nations still need to exist. So God's ordained that that will still exist, that we can have Ezekiel 38 and 39 be fulfilled in these kinds of things. You know, there's some things that God does determine. Raise your hand if you chose to be born the gender you were born. No, you don't have a say in that. Did you choose to be born, you know, whatever race you are? No, God does determine some things. But does that mean that God determines all things? It's like, all right, I picked you to go to hell. You can't even repent if you wanted to. Ha, it's because I love you. This is the most loving thing I could do. Best of all possible worlds. Like, I don't know. I'm not seeing it. You have to twist the scriptures if you want to believe this. And there's many who will do that. We should be very cautious of having to throw logic and consistency, rationality out the window in order to believe a certain doctrine or teaching. If you have a teaching that you're confronted with, guys, and it requires you to throw logic out the window... There's a big red flag there. God is logical. He's the author of logic, right? He's the author of mathematics. He's the author of reason and intelligence. He's given us a very reasonable faith. And if some doctrine or teaching requires us to throw truth out the window, then we should throw that doctrine out the window. Especially when it's not something that's clearly spelled out in the Bible. And there's a lot of debate and you don't even see it emerge for hundreds of years. It's not in any of the writings of the early church fathers. It's not, not clearly spelled out in God's word. Be careful. Take a look at verses 29 through 31. It says, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues. No, wait, sorry. They spoke the word of God with boldness. Interesting. So here in verse 29 and 31 especially, we see what happens when believers are filled with the empowering boldness of the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues. No, they speak the word of God with boldness. Wow. That's very different than what a lot of Christians, a lot of Pentecostals, these kinds of denominations would say. They would say, well, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to start speaking in tongues, which is the exact opposite of what we read here. It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit at the end of verse 31, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. 
It's not debatable. This is the heyday of the early church. This is the golden age of the early church. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. They're doing miracles, like we see mentioned in verse 30. And it's all with the goal of boldly preaching, boldly proclaiming God's word. Because as we've talked about before, guys, only the gospel changes people. Only the gospel saves people. And so our adversary will do anything he can to distract us, to get us focused on other things. Especially since we're right here at the end of time with everything the Bible tells us will happen at the end of time, happening right now. And it's not just that, but you know, month after month, year after year, everything continues to not only accelerate, but also converge. So now we have all these different areas of prophecy that are now converging which is really crazy. What a weird coincidence. You know, I always get a kick out of the people that believe it was fulfilled in 70 AD, the book of Revelation. It was already, it already happened. To which I always respond, well, that's weird that it's happening again then, huh? Like, oh, yeah, it's happening again. Shocking. But this time, literally, instead of figuratively, they're like, it's allegorical. It happened allegorically. Well, that's weird because now it's happening literally. Maybe you got it wrong. No, okay. It's very much like what we see with the religious leaders, right? Where they see the evidence and they're like, no, no, we got our doctrine. It's almost like it's all happening again, huh? Weird. I'm sure it's nothing. But, you know, church, Satan is about to have his moment. But in order for that to line up, because there's a lot of planning and stuff that Satan has to try to accomplish here in order to have his, his five minutes of fame. In order for that to line up, he has to find some way to distract and divert the church away from its core mission, which, as we just read, is preaching the word of God with boldness. So he has to find a way to distract us away from that and onto other things. And like we talk about all the time, a good thing becomes a bad thing when it takes the place of the best thing, right? And so Satan's goal is to take these things that are really bad things and get us to focus on those things instead of focusing on the worst thing, which is people going to hell, right? We don't want people to go to hell. We, that's the most important thing. Satan is a lot of things, guys. But he isn't dumb. I don't think anybody wise that knows the scriptures would think Satan's dumb. You know, he knows that if he can distract us with other goals, with other issues, then we'll stop preaching the word of God. You know, we'll stop preaching the gospel. And we'll start focusing on these other valid concerns, these valid issues, like how our justice system is being weaponized against, you know, conservatives or whatever, or how the public schools, the media and the large corporations are all working to pervert and trans the kids. These things drive us crazy, right? Or how our culture is literally celebrating killing babies now. There's like things you see it. They're like, I had an abortion. I'm so proud of you. Like, oh, wow, that's. That's really weird, like, or any number of other valid issues, guys. We're literally, you know, bringing in tens of millions of, you know, military-aged males, illegals from countries that largely hate us. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that we could focus on that are like, ah, right, make you want to pull your hair out. There's any number of valid issues that are designed to cause outrage, and rightfully so. These are atrocious things. It's a tragedy that these things are that these things are happening, right? It's it's terrible. But that's Satan's master plan, guys, to get us all so outraged, so distracted that we stop preaching God's word and we start focusing on these other things. It's pretty smart when you think about it, right? It's a good plan. It's a diversion. It's like you're playing a hide-and-seek game and you got a really good hiding spot, but not just that, but you also got some diversions. So when people get close to you, you send out, to, they're about to find your hiding spot, so you send out a bunch of your friends to be like, oh my gosh, the fire alarm, somebody pulled the fire alarm. You know, it's like, it's exactly what Satan's doing, right? He's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta make it to the end here. I'm about to get it. We gotta distract everybody. The goal is so that we stop preaching God's word, guys. The goal is so that we stop preaching Jesus Christ and that we start focusing on these other valid issues, these valid concerns. I think anybody with a brain is freaked out by those things that I just mentioned, right? Those things are horrifying. 
Like, that's crazy, the stuff that's going on right now. And yet, what's the real end game? Heaven and hell. The salvation of men's souls. This is our mission. So what's the solution? Well, it's exactly what we see here in this morning's text. Read, take a look. Let's read verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was to get, assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. The solution, if we want to fix this world, and we're not going to, we already know it's, it's all falling apart, but if we want to fulfill our mission, if we want to do well, our mission is the same mission that the disciples have here. Our solution is the same solution that the disciples have here. We need to pray that the Lord will fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can be bold, not to be culture warriors, but to preach the gospel. Because that's what changes people. Precisely because the hour is late. Precisely because the time is at hand. We need to finish strong, church. We need to have that same mindset that the early church had. No matter the cost, no matter what happens, we got to keep fighting the good fight. And remember, guys, they were in a much darker culture than us, socially, culturally. It's insane. I, I won't get into it because there's kids here, but on some Friday night, we could talk about the stuff that was going on in the Roman culture. Oh my gosh, like completely psychotic. You know, and their mission, keep preaching the gospel, keep fighting the good fight, keep preaching God's word. Even as the world burned down around them, even as the world was going to hell in a handbasket, and it surely is, guys. And that's got to be our mission as well. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, Lord. Your word is truth. And Lord, we thank you that you've empowered us to actually make a change here. Lord, we know it's not going to change what's coming. It's not the day of the devil. It's the day of the Lord that's coming. And Lord, we know that this is your plan. But Lord, we also know that Satan knows he has but a little time. And so his mission is to distract us. And Lord, we do not want to be distracted. So Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would fill us with your love. And that we would have that same mindset that the early church had to want to be about your business, preaching your word with boldness. So Lord Jesus, we pray that you would strengthen us to do that and that you would give us the clarity of mind and the focus and the determination to recognize the things that are bad things, but are not the worst thing. Lord, the worst thing is that all these people, our friends, our family, our coworkers, our neighbors, they're on their way to hell without you, Jesus. And Lord, we have the tickets to heaven, so help us to be bold, preaching the gospel, preaching your word. And Lord, use us as we do that. Make appointments for us, Lord, so that we can be about your business. So that when you come back, when you open up the sky, we can be found so doing. And we can hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. So Lord, bless your servants as we do this, Lord. Bless this time of fellowship, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we worship you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for that one. We might get chased out of town for that one. Pray for us. Did we just survive?